Hey folks, even though it is a cold and rainy day here in Shelburne, Nova Scotia, we are going to have a conversation tonight about Abraham and Isaac, Genesis chapter 22. It's that story where Abraham hears God asking him to offer his son Isaac as a burnt offering. Now, a lot of people, when it comes to this story, their first reaction is, how can he? Whether it's about Abraham, how could Abraham possibly be willing to sacrifice his, his son? How could you possibly be willing to sacrifice your child to God? The question also comes around, how could God possibly ask anybody to sacrifice their child? What kind of maniacal beast would do that? What kind of self-centered, selfish, unloving monster would say, Abraham, you need to sacrifice your child to me? Those would both be incredibly modern questions to ask about this story. Now, I'm going to tell you straight out, one of my best sources for this story came from a book called Abraham by a fellow by the name of Bruce Feiler. I highly recommend you, you, you take a look at it. it. There's an entire chapter about this one story. The book itself is about how Abraham as a person is seen in Christianity, in Judaism, and in Islam. It's, it's just, it's a wonderful book. Check it out. It's, 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 it's well worth the read. Anyway, back to Abraham and Isaac. For those that don't know the story, this is a very, very, very brief explanation. Abraham hears God saying, Abraham, offer your son Isaac to me as a burnt offering. Abraham takes Isaac and a couple of servants and they start walking towards, towards the mountain where they're going to make this sacrifice. As they get closer, Abraham sends, tells the servants to stay there. He tells Isaac to come forward. He makes Isaac carry the wood for the fire. Isaac says, but dad, where are we going to find the lamb? We didn't bring anything to, we didn't bring anything to offer. And Abraham says, God will provide. They get to the mountain, they set up the pyre, they set up where the, the sacrifice is going to take place. Isaac somehow is, is, is bound and, and put on the pyre. He doesn't seem to put up much of a fight. Abraham gets ready to strike. He has a knife. He gets ready to kill his son. An angel, an angel of the Lord appears and said, Abraham, whoa, 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 don't do this. No, we're good. You don't have to do this. God will provide. God, because you were willing to sacrifice your son, your action, your life is seen as a testament of faith. We, we see that you are obedient. We see that you are good. Abraham turns to the side in this thicket of, of brush. He sees a, lamb, a, a ram excuse me, caught in the brush. Its horns are caught in the brush. He grabs the, the ram by the horns. He takes it out. He sacrifices the ram. And that's kind of how the story ends. Now, one of the things that, that Bruce Feiler mentions is that this story has had many, 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 many different meanings over the generations. Since it was first spoken, since it was first offered in, a, in an oral tradition through t storytelling around the campfires, to, you know, through the time of the conquest, the time of the exile, the return, through the time of, of Roman occupation, through Jesus' time, through the rise of Christianity, uh, within Judaism and within Islam, from that time until today. This story has had many, 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 many different powerful meanings. It's meant, a, it's meant a lot to a lot of different people in a lot of different circumstances and in a lot of different contexts. Now, from the Christian perspective, we would say, well, God provided the ram, just like God provided Jesus. And, and sometimes the story, I think, gets boxed, for the, from the Christians, the story sometimes gets boxed inside of that context. Oh, God provides the son, God provides the lamb, God provides the offering, and there it is. But as I've said, there have been many, many, many interpretations of this story over the years. I'm a fan of looking at it from context. Because not only do I get to see what maybe what other people around that time would have seen, but I also get to explore maybe some of the things that were going on in their lives. It, it gives me a deeper sense of understanding of this scripture. So for those people that first heard this story, 
this story was not a story that would have led them to, believe, to wonder, how could Abraham do this? Or how could God ask for this to be done? The people that this story was written for, their identity was found in their very special and very unique relationship with God. They knew who God is. They, they, they knew how to relate to God. They had their ways. So this story was just, okay. Like they wouldn't have asked, how could God ask that? They were surrounded by deities in the region they lived in that would ask for child sacrifice. The question, so God in this story was just asking for what every other God around that time would have asked for. For Abraham, they wouldn't have said, Abraham, how could you? They would have said, who among us would say no to God? Abraham was just doing what any obedient servant of God should do. So these two things weren't elements of tension. The tension in the story was found in how will God show God's self to be different than the other gods of the region? How will God come through? How will God make this right? Because remember, the people this story is being shared with are the children of Abraham. They are the children of Isaac. They are the children of Jacob. It becomes Israel. Isaac's son. They know Isaac survives. There is no tension. That's, that's not where the tension of this story sits. The tension of the story is found in how did God get us through this moment? Now the answer, again, and this is from a Christian perspective, and I'm, I do wonder if it is my particular faith that informs my particular interpretation of this story. But it does come back to God providing the sacrifice. Not just God providing the sacrifice as we see in the crucifixion, but that God always actually provides the sacrifice to God. There's a piece of scripture in 1 Chronicles chapter 29. Now it says, all things come from God. And all that I give back to God came from God. In the old language in our prayer book, it's all things come of thee and of thine own have we given thee. The sentiment is, everything that I have belongs to God. And so when I make a sacrifice, when I make an offering, when I tithe, I'm really only giving back that which God has given me. To me, this story speaks of God's continuous work to offer what we offer back, what we offer into the world. I did that story last night about the gentleman who did a thousand shoe boxes so far. He's still moving. He's still doing his thing. He's given a thousand shoe boxes out to children through Operation Christmas Child. He would see each one of those shoe boxes not as him giving of himself, but rather him giving of how God has blessed him. In this moment with Abraham and Isaac, the ram appears. God provides the ram to make the sacrifice. God provides the ram so that Abraham and Isaac may together make an offering. But the truth is, throughout the course of, at least for, through the course of the Old Testament, where, where we hear that there are rules about sacrifice, whether it's a, a sheep or a dove or, or a ram or an ox, all of those things that, that the people would have offered, you know, the firstborn, perhaps, all of those things were things that they knew to be provided by God in the first place. They weren't really giving up something that they seen as their own. They were giving back something that God had given them. Now again, this story has had dozens and dozens and dozens of important 
powerful interpretations dependent upon where people were standing at the time. I'm sure you've heard dozens of interpretations of this particular scripture. I don't offer that my interpretation is the interpretation. I don't offer that there is any one interpretation available to us that is the interpretation. I would encourage you though to explore this scripture as much as is possible for us in this day and age from the perspective of those people who would have first told the story, from the perspective of those people who would have first heard the story. It opens us up a little bit. It allows us to empathize with a completely different day and age, to step outside of where we are, and to experience God in a way that we are not accustomed to, in a way that we're not easily privy to. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord's face be made to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord's countenance be lifted up to you. May you always know the peace of being in the Lord's presence. And as we remember God's call to offer to God, I pray that you'll remember that all that we have is a gift of, from God in the first place. And that we're just giving it back in some way. Amen.